have a look behind me. What's the difference between these two pictures? They look pretty similar, right? And yet, they're very, very different. Let's dive into this. On the first picture, what you see is a patient sharing personal, sometimes intimate, information with the doctor, who in return provides trusted advice on how to get better. Here, the interests of everyone are very clear. In particular, for the doctor, his interests are codified by the oath he swore when we, he became a doctor. The oath to abstain from doing harm and to protect secrets and information shared by their patient. Now in the second picture, what's happening here? Again, the doctor, the patient, sharing information, but the tool they're using is a bit different. It's, it's no longer a paper and a pen. Here, it's a computer. It's a digital system. And in this digital system live two images of the patient and the doctor. The health data of the patient and the algorithms that help the doctor process th this data and provide advice. In addition to this, there are, this computer is connected to the internet. So it's also connected to the 4.2 billion people who used the internet in 2018. So now the scope of this situation is very different than in the first picture. Here, whose interests are being represented in this situation? Not only the patients, not only the doctor, but also the interests of a number of people on the internet. And given what we've seen, with the recent rise of cyber threats, we can legitimately ask the question, how do we deal with trust in the situation? Zut alors. That's serious. Okay, we need to talk. So there are two ways, three ways, to handle this situation. The first way is just plainly, flat out, to refuse to use those digital systems anywhere, at the doctor, but also in, in your life, when you have trustworthy conversation, you can say, well, I'm going to avoid having this conversation using digital tools. It's not very practical as a solution for at least two reasons. The first reason is that computers are being everywhere. They're in your pockets, they're in your car, they're at work, and they're on vacation with you. Computers are everywhere, and it's not going to get better than that. The second thing is that computers also bring a lot of intelligence, a lot of good to the situations that we see. For instance, uh, we know now that uh, doctors actually make better decisions, and in particular detect better tumors when they're assisted by computers. So myself, as a citizen, as a patient, I want to make sure that my doctor is equipped with the best tools, and these tools might include computers. So really, this option, this choice A, is really a difficult choice to, to go for. Now, the second choice is to use those computers and trust that they will do the right thing that the people who have been programming the computers and handling your data will have your best interests at heart. So in a, in a sense, you're not entering the dig digital world, you're looking at the digital world through a window. And that's also a difficult option, because while some groups might be aligned with your interests, that's not counting with the people who want to attack, your interests through cyber attacks, 
or it's not also counting people who might change their mind and their interest might shift from yours. So really, having faith and belief I is something that's a bit complicated today. The third choice is to reason, to build knowledge, and to educate. And here, that's the difficult choice. But we have several keys that are coming into place that allow us to be optimistic about this choice here. Which, which reasons, which keys? Well, first, scientific keys. We now have new tools to allow us to better understand and better protect the digital world and our lives in the digital world. So for instance, scientists have been developing ways to, perf to compute on encrypted data, which means that whenever you share your data, you send it out to the internet. That data is encrypted as soon as it leaves your hands to the internet. And the advice you can get from the internet is also encrypted, not readable, when it come back, comes back to you. So the only person who knows what's the data and what is the advice is yourself. That's really exciting because that's a, that's a wonderful tool to better control how we share data. And these developments have been pioneered by Craig Gentry. And recently, in particular in satellite, teams are scrambling to put this technology into the hand of data processing engineers to make sure that we build the systems with these properties in mind and these capabilities in mind. The second enthusiast and um, very interesting uh, development is our capability to guarantee the behavior of software. More precisely, what we're doing is we're showing that certain behaviors in certain software are no longer possible. And we're providing mathematical guarantees that this cannot be the case and that these behaviors are respected. By doing this, what you say is whatever the operating conditions of the software that gives me advice, whatever those conditions, however it's being attacked, I will be able to rely on their decisions. And so these developments that have been pioneered um, by uh, Cuzo, uh, by Sifakis, by Hoare, nowadays are also being uh, implemented into tools by teams in Satellet to give that to software engineers and provide those capabilities to new generations of software developers. But those keys, scientific and as exciting as they might be, they're actually nothing if we don't educate on top of those. And the same way that we teach our children when they cross a road that they have to look left and right before crossing, the same way we teach them that how to use medicine, this same way we have to teach them about the rules uh, in the digital world and the right practices in the digital world. And not only our children, but also our friends, our sisters, our parents, our grandparents. Here we have an amazing chance in France where a number of teachers are already very active in bringing this knowledge to the masses, to both little children in elementary school and people at university. And finally, the final ingredient is we need to build communities around this general idea of understanding and building knowledge about the, the digital world. This means we have to pull together beyond scientists, beyond teacher, we have to bring in people like hackerspaces, uh, people like politics, people like who work in NGOs and in government, people who work in SMEs and in large companies. We have to bring all that together because from that diversity and from the diversity that rises from the European scale that we need to do this at, from this diversity, we will build better trust in digital world. That's exciting. This talk started with a grim reality, a dark reality. But now what we're realizing is that we can combat things like 
the obscure, um, the, the irrational. We can build knowledge, we can build ethics. We can build for our communities more freedom and more equality in the digital world. And this has happened before, several times in humanity, this kind of opportunity. For instance, it happened during the Enlightenment. And if Spinoza was here, he would tell us, go ahead, reach out to your daughters, to your fathers, to your grandmothers. Reach out and bring them together to build together a new age of digital enlightenment. Thank you.